Shalom, shalom, folks. Shaul Dog here once again with your weekly drash. Uh, this is Parsha 11. By Gash, he approached. That's what it means. Uh, chapter 44, verse 18 through chapter 47, verse 27. And uh, we're almost to Exodus already. Can you believe that? <laughs> Seriously. But uh, we're just getting to the end of Genesis, Bereshit, okay? We're getting right to the end of it, and it's really starting to build. But we're going to see how Yah works here even more now, okay? Uh, now, Yosef's brother was starting to inquire about why Yosef worked the way he did. Asked so many questions about this one family and everything else because they know a busy leader is not, you know, he's not going to take the time to ask about every person's family. So there had to be some kind of, uh, uh, you know, modus operandi, so to speak. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, he spilled the beans, though. Okay, we go into Genesis 45, uh, verses 4 through 9. Yosef said to his brothers, please come closer. And they came closer. He said, I am Yosef, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. But don't be sad that you sold me into slavery here or angry at yourselves because it was Yahweh who sent me ahead of you to preserve life. The famine has been over the land for the past two years, and for yet another five years there will be neither plowing nor harvest. Yahweh sent me ahead of you to ensure that you will have descendants on earth and to save your lives in great deliverance. So it was not you who had sent me here, but Yahweh. And he had made me a father to Pharaoh. Lord of all of his household and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go up and get my father. Tell him, this is what your son, sa son Yosef says. Yahweh has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. So uh, Yosef immediately ordered that uh, his father and all, all of his relatives and everything else be brought back to Egypt. Okay, there is still no plan as far as where they're going to go or whatever, you know, uh, things like that had to pass by Pharaoh first. Okay, they Yosef didn't have that complete of power. Okay, it was just, you know, uh one step below Pharaoh. So, you know, he uh you know, he had to go through the proper protocol. You know, you you have your pecking order, you know, you have your your CEOs and, you know, your lower management and all that stuff. You, you know how that works. It's just a structure of things. But um uh, then we go into Genesis 45, 17 through 24. Pharaoh said to Yosef, tell your brothers, here's what you're to do. Load up your animals. You know, when, when he was told about uh, going and retrieving all the family here. He says, load up your animals. Go to the land of Canaan. That's Canaan, if you haven't noticed already. <laughs> Take your father and your families and come back to me. I will give you good property in Egypt and you'll eat the fat of the land. Moreover, this is an order. Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt to carry your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Don't worry about your stuff because everything good in the land of Egypt is yours. Now, this is really cool how Yah works and how he blessed Joseph or Yosef, however you want to say it, uh, in that manner. But the sons of Israel acted accordingly. And Yosef gave them wagons as Pharaoh had ordered and uh, gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave a set of new clothes, but to Benjamin he gave seven and a half pounds of silver and five sets of new clothes. Likewise, to his father he sent ten donkeys loaded with the finest goods Egypt produced, as well as ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father to eat on the return journey. Thus he sent his brothers on the way. And they left and said to him, Don't quarrel among yourselves while you're traveling. Now Israel was told in the news, uh, and, uh, you know, that Yosef was alive, and he was overjoyed, you know. <laughs> and he, you know, he tended to believe that his sons were BSing him, basically. But he believed that when he saw this big caravan of stuff just coming back, because he sent his sons off with somewhat of a meager amount of money. But then they come back with all this abundance, you know. So when they came back and said, Yosef is alive, uh, well, he was overjoyed. because, And he believed them because he saw all this abundance coming back. You know, he knows in his head there's no way uh, they could have bought all that with all the, you know, with the money that I gave them. And I raised them not to be thieves, so I know they didn't steal it, you know. 
<laughs> you know, their God is the same God. You know, so, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was just overjoyed to hear that Yosef, his son, was alive. You know, for so many years, he thought he was dead, you know, and uh, he, he mourned Yosef. And and just he was distraught, you know. Probably put extra gray hairs on his head. <laughs> I mean, you know, and uh, it's sort of like um, you know that shooting up in Connecticut. You know, you you have the parents there, you know, grieving over their children. You know, just put yourself in the, uh, you know, in the shoes of Israel. You know, his son Yosef is like, you know, he, he's told that Yosef's dead. He has this bloody. Uh, uh, robe and everything like that. You know, it's all convincing, and his son hasn't come back home. You know, that had to be terrible for him. It had to be. But uh, we go into chapter 46, verse 1, and uh, continue on to verse 4. Israel took everything he owned with him on his journey. He arrived at Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. In a vision at night, Yahweh called to Israel, Yahav, Yahav. He answered, here I am. He said, I am Yahweh, the, uh, the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. It is there that I will make you into a great nation. Not only will I go down with you to Egypt, but I will also bring you back here again after Yosef has closed your eyes. Now, wait a minute. Israel, a great nation. In Egypt. That's not how we know it today. <laughs> Egypt is Egypt and uh, Israel is Israel. You know, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, going to make them a great nation in Egypt. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, does accomplish his feat later on. He does. And uh, that's just how Yah works. Because, um, you know, when Yah says he's going to do something, he doesn't mean right here and now most of the time. He might mean right here and now, if it's needed right here and now, if it's part of his plan and everything. But basically, he says, I'm going to make a great nation of you. Well, you know, you're going to die and you're not going to see this great nation, but he's still going to uh, fulfill his promise. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter what he promises. He is going to come through on his promise, whether you're alive or not to see it. Okay. But that's called blessing the bloodline. And blessing the bloodline, uh, that goes right into the second commandment where idolatry is. Um, you know, where it says you're not to make for yourselves any idols or any carved image. You're not to bow down to them or serve them. I will punish uh, your children to the third and fourth generation, but I will bless to the thousandth generation those who love me and keep my mitzvot. Okay. Uh, that's what it goes to. It goes to generational blessings because they're obeying what Yah says to do. Okay. Once again, the Torah is still very much alive here. Okay. But the problem is a lot of people don't read the scriptures to know that the Torah is alive here. They don't understand Torah. They haven't uh, read any Torah or absorbed any of it or obeyed any of it or anything in order to actually see the behavior of people in scripture and to apply it to Torah principles. Okay. So many people have uh, the Talmud on their heads and, and Christian doctrines on their heads and everything like that. And basically, you might as well put your head in the sand, stick your head in a, you know, in a hole in the wall or something, because you're not seeing or hearing or sensing anything about the Torah, the, the true heartbeat of all of Scripture. You know, if, if you took Torah out of Scripture, then you have no Scripture. You just have a bunch of pretty stories, okay? The, the, where the meat is is where the Torah is at. But anyways, <laughs> um, you know, that when they arrived in Egypt, they had to go before Pharaoh, okay? So they got all their stories straight, okay, so that everything would go well. Yosef instructed them pretty well. And uh, he said to his brothers in verse 31, uh, and his uh, father's family, I'm going up to tell Pharaoh, and I'll say to him, my brothers and my father's family who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds and keepers of livestock. They have brought their flocks, their herds, and all their possessions. Now when Pharaoh summons you and asks, what is your occupation? Tell him your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our ancestors. This will ensure that you will live in the land of Goshen. For any shepherd is abhorrent to the Egyptians. They didn't like shepherds all that much. You know, they're an industrial 
you know, uh, industrial uh, country, you know, uh, a kingdom or whatever you want to call it. They were not uh, uh, agricultural as much as industrial. You know, they they just didn't like, you know, and the, they smelled like their animals and everything like that. You know, the, the, they were, uh, you know, snobby upper class type, you know. And uh, you see the same behavior in every in every single uh, uh, successful uh, empire, you know. I mean, uh, you see that in the Roman Empire, you see it in the Babylonian Empire, you see it in the uh, Egyptian Empire, you also see it in the British Empire, and uh, most recently in the United States Empire. Uh, you see it all, all like that, you know. I mean, it, it just... Whenever you have abundance and everything like that, it goes to people's heads and people seem to think that they're better than other people. And, you know, uh, oh, you deal with animals and stuff. Uh, you, you stink. Just get away from me. You know, uh, that's just basically the attitude. But let's uh, continue with chapter 47. Then Yosef went in and told Pharaoh, my father's father and brothers have come to the land of Canaan or come from the land of Canaan with their flocks, livestock and all of their possessions. Right now they're in the land of Goshen. He took five of his brothers, presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? They answered, Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our ancestors. And added, we have come to live in the land because in the land of Canaan, there is no place to pasture your servants' flocks. Now, see, he's already saying, okay, Pharaoh, my flocks are your flocks, okay? You know, and uh, I'm your servant, you know? So, you know, by saying you're... You are somebody's servant, then whatever you have belongs to them. So it's basically uh, putting a huge olive branch out there to them. But um, it goes on to say, the famine is so severe there. Therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Pharaoh said to Yosef, your father and brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt lies before you. Have your fathers and brothers live on the best property in the country. Let them live in the land of Goshen. Moreover, moreover if you uh, know that some of them are particularly competent. Put them in charge of my livestock. I mean, there's there's a lot of blessing there. <laughs> Yo Yosef then brought Yaakov, his father, and presented him to Pharaoh. Yaakov blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked Yaakov, how old are you? And Yaakov replied, the time of my stay on this earth has been 130 years. They have been few and difficult, fewer than the years my ancestors lived. Then Yaakov blessed Pharaoh and left his presence. He also found a place for his father and brothers and gave them property in the land of Egypt in the best region of the country, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Yosef provided food for his father, his brothers, and all his father's household, taking full care of even the youngest. Now, see, now we're going to get into the meat of the story, okay? Now, Egypt was turned in from a thriving metropolis into uh, a slave state almost overnight, Okay. We're going to see what happens here and how Yah basically, he'll bless a country, even if they're lawless, he will bless a country just for a select few people that are in that country, okay? But then uh, he's going to put certain people into place within that country and then crush that country. It's happened over and over and over again, and it's no different with Egypt here. There is no food anywhere, for the famine was very severe. So that both Egypt and Canaan grew weak from hunger. Yosef collected all the money there was in Egypt and Canaan in exchange for the grain they bought and put the money in Pharaoh's treasury. When all the money in Egypt had been spent, and likewise in Canaan, all the Egyptians approached Yosef and said, Give us something to eat. Even though we have no money, we should, you know, why should we die before your eyes? Yosef replied, Give me your livestock if you don't have money. I will give you food in exchange for your livestock. So they brought Yosef their livestock, and Yosef gave them food in exchange for the horses, flocks, cattle, and donkeys. And all that year, he provided them with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was over, they approached Yosef again and said to him, We won't hide from my lord that all our money is spent, and the herds of livestock belong to my lord. We have nothing left, as my lord can see, but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, so we and our land will be enslaved to Pharaoh. Now, see, you, you see, they, they willingly, 
out of lack of faith in Yah, because they didn't believe in him, okay, they were idolaters, they believed in uh, all kinds of other gods that stemmed from Babylon, from Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz, they believed in all these other gods, they didn't believe in Yah, they didn't have faith in Yah, and this is why they sold themselves into slavery, okay? But, um, goes on to say, but also give us seed to plant so that we could stay alive and not die, so that the land won't become barren. So Yosef acquired all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. As one by one the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine weighed on them so severely. Thus the land became the property of Pharaoh. As for the people, he reduced them to serfdom, city by city, from one end of Egypt's territory to the other. Only the priest's land did not, he did not acquire because the priests were entitled to provisions from Pharaoh, and they ate from what Pharaoh provided them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Yosef said to the people, As of today I have acquired you and your land for Pharaoh. Here is seed for you to sow the land. When, you har when your harvest time comes, you are to give 20% to Pharaoh. 80% will be yours to keep for seed to plant in the fields, as well as for your food and for that of your household and your little ones. They replied, You have saved our lives, so if it pleases my Lord, we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Okay, they, they, they just willingly, willingly went into slavery, like I said, out of lack of faith. Okay? Yosef made it a law for the country of Egypt, vowed to this day that Pharaoh should have 20%. Only the property belonging to the priests did not come, become Pharaoh's. Israel lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. They acquired possessions in it and were productive, and their numbers multiplied greatly. Now, see, like I was saying, Egypt was a lawless nation, and they rejected Yahanna's Torah. You know, but uh, they were granted abundance. They were, because Yah had a master plan. This master plan uh, was more than just uh, uh, trying to bless the Egyptian people, because the Egyptian people didn't, uh, uh, didn't earn those blessings. You know, earn them by their obedience to Yah. Okay, they were totally defiant. They were worshiping other gods, the same way Christians do with their trees and their bunnies and all that stuff. You know, and with Jesus, which is not even uh, in the Hebraic Scriptures. You know, there's there is no such person named Jesus ever born in Israel. Okay, but you know the the christians are worshiping the same gods that the romans did and the romans are worshiping the same gods that the greeks did and the greeks were worshiping the same gods that the egyptians did and the egyptians were uh you know worshiping the same gods that the babylonians did you see what i'm saying uh, they just transferred gods from uh empire to empire society to society okay but none of them worship yah not one of them and uh you know, there there had to be something there to sustain Yah's people there, you know. So he made sure not only, uh, you know, the, the, the land and uh, the food and everything else, the livestock and everything like that, not only that, okay, but also a person in power so no one would turn against him, okay. Uh, in the upcoming Torah portions, we're going to see how uh, the Egyptians— uh, even though they sold themselves into slavery, well, the Hebrews were taken into slavery because of a different, uh, a different ruler in Egypt. Okay, and um, you know everything was going great. You know, it was like a role reversal. The Egyptians were slaves, and the Hebrews were free. <laughs> but then it was a role reversal. Why? Because the Hebrews. Uh, were growing up in the land, you know, they were raising kids and everything like that. They were uh, procreating. They were, um, you know, they were multiplying like, you know, like crazy. And these kids were ra raised in an Egyptian culture. And these kids were adopting Egyptian gods and practices and everything else. Even though they were raised to worship Yah, okay, they were still partaking in these practices and everything. So, they could have stayed in Egypt as free people for a long, long time. But no, Yah would not have that because the Hebrews were going the direction of the Egyptians. Okay, so uh, they went into slavery. Okay, that's in the next Torah portion. But it's sort of like the United States of America. Okay, uh, we already see people selling themselves into slavery, uh, just uh, accepting all these laws that are put on them and everything else, that's a form of slavery. 
and uh, and going through all these government regulations and everything, and and paying this money and that money to just to be able to buy a license to do something that you know any free society would be able to do. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the United States of America is slowly selling itself into slavery, and it's it's almost like a total repeat of what was happening in Egypt, and. The whole thing is the United States of America has never worshipped Yah as a whole. Okay, you say it's a Christian nation. That's great. Uh, you brought Roman gods in here and everything like that, and you dressed it up with a little bit of scripture from the New Testament, changed the name of the Messiah from Yeshua to Isis, and then it evolved into Jesus. Great. That's wonderful. But that's not why we were getting abundance. There were a lot of people within that religion who were seeking Yah with uh, open heart. And I believe that's what sustained us. But right now, pretty much the majority of people in this country are turning away from Yah. And if they turn away from Yah, they turn away from his blessings too. And when they turn away from his blessings, guess what happens? Everything collapses. And we're going to see this. We are going to see this. And all these people are looking to politicians and everything else for, for help. And, oh, uh, you know, common sense says, yeah, gee, some kids were killed. And it was a guy with a gun or a couple guys with a gun. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, these guys, okay, that's great. These kids were killed. Wonderful. You know, we got, we got the story down and everything like that. And it was a gun. What if that guy went in there and stabbed all these kids? Think about that. Would they talk, uh, be talking about the uh, banning of knives? No, they wouldn't. But no, since a gun was used, oh, we have to ban guns. I even heard the Connecticut governor get up there and say, well, 20-shot magazines are more dangerous than 10-shot magazines. I never heard of a magazine just jumping up out of a out of a box or out of a drawer or off a countertop or whatever and just bouncing through the neighborhood and going on a rampage. You know, what is it, the 20-shot magazines, all of a sudden, you, you know, they had a rougher life grooms or something in neighborhoods, you know, single-parent homes or you know? <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, the single-parent homes or whatever, it's just, you know, what's up with the 20-shot magazines and the 10-shot magazines? 10-shot magazines had more opportunities in life? You know, I mean, they're talking about inanimate objects. It's the people. It's the people that control these objects, and, and the fact is, the people need spiritual healing. You know, I'm hearing this Marvin Gaye song going through my head, only it's saying spiritual healing. <laughs> and uh, that's what people need in this country. That's what people need around this world. But we're never going to see abundance again in the United States of America as long as people are, are running off after their own desires and partaking in pagan fertility rituals like Christmas and Easter. It ain't going to happen. You know, and, uh, you know, if there was one thing I would abolish from uh, from the Constitution would be freedom of religion. And, uh, you know, I would make the, the scriptures the law of the land. But that's me <laughs> because the scriptures heal. The scriptures build righteous people. OK, the laws of men tear down people. They destroy neighborhoods. They destroy things. That's what I'm saying. But. Be sure to seek first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness. Take care. I look forward to the next time.